Um, some of you know that the Bitterroot National Forest has been working on a climbing management plan. And um, I have been to those meetings and climbers have been to those meetings and um, several other people have been um, giving information to them and expressing opinions to them. And they are going to publish what's called a story map pretty soon, probably in the next two weeks on the Forest Service website. And then lots of people can weigh in. Anybody who wants to can weigh in. I will just say from my perspective that this all started with a concern about raptors. And we in Bitterroot Audubon, we started something called Raptor Guardians to see, go down out in the canyons and try to find active golden eagle and peregrine nests and then um, alert the Forest Service, hey, there's an active nest here, maybe you should do a climbing closure. That's how it all started. And there wasn't very much about protecting wildlife, including raptors, in the draft of the story map that I've seen so far. That could change before it goes public, but um, I will send something out to all the members when the story map goes public and you can look at it on the Bitterroot National Forest website. Okay. Um, I'm going to, oh, I won't hand this over to Becky, but I'll just tell everyone, we're gonna have a calendar next year. The calendar committee is gonna get going on it soon. Um, Kay, are you on? Kay, have you seen Kay on here? Because I haven't. Oh yes, she's here. Okay. I can unmute. I got it. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, it's my turn. Yeah, it's your turn to introduce our star speaker. Okay, before I introduce our star speaker, <laughs> uh, I'm the program coordinator and I wanna say, please, please, please mute yourselves and turn off your video. <clears throat> it's a little disconcerting to watch somebody um, eating their sandwiches while our speaker is speaking. So <laughs> uh, please do that now. And we're be this is being recorded. I just want, yeah. I forgot to say that. So if everybody would uh, turn off their video. <clears throat> I'm looking at a few people right now. So your video is, is on, you're not turned off. Good, good job, Christ Christine. <laughs> okay, um, well, I'm excited. I am so excited to have Kate Stone give us a presentation again. It's been a little while. And so, and I keep bugging her, you know, once you do this, when, when can you do that? <clears throat> you, I'm sure if I asked you all to give me um, one or two words about this amazing scientist and uh, educator. <laughs> we could do a book, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> no, she's so um, talented. And uh, Kate uh, really has impacted Bitter at Audubon in amazing ways over the years, starting with a, a lot of um, taking this out on field trips and, uh, and doing citizen science. Um, in a big way. <clears throat> and I can think of many nighttime, a lot of nighttime things with her, you know, going out to see owls and in the process, scaring up the, the um, herons. I mean, you know, <laughs> amazing things that happen when you go with Kate. Uh, moths, moths are another thing that she'll take you out in the middle of the night, you know, to go see. Um, and of course, <clears throat> not nighttime for me. I, I didn't get to go out to trap the um, nighthawks, but uh, in the last well, a couple of years, I think, Kate's really focused on nighthawks <clears throat> and uh, poor wills uh, and, and has actually managed to um, put some uh, monitors on them so that she could follow them. And then I'm sure you've named them all. So I'm going to be interested to see, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> 
what you call your friends. But anyway, <clears throat> so tonight she's going to take us on a trip. Of course, I asked her, you know, when, when she's doing this write up, if she could, you know, these guys go all over the world into warmer climes, if she could just, you know, maybe get a picture of a of a beach, but not only did she get the picture of a beach, but she put the Nighthawk out there drinking, probably a margarita or something. So um, this should be a great, great trip. Uh, amazing, amazing scientist. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks, Kate. Glad you're here. Wow, uh, thanks, Kay. I had to kind of mute myself too. I love you. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. I'm, I'm so glad so many of you are here. It's kind of weird to present this way um, since now I'm just kind of seeing your, your names, but just know I'm really happy you're here. And if people are joining in that aren't from the Bitterroot or um, Missoula areas in Montana, send us a, a little message in the chat and just let us know where you're from. That helps us kind of figure out kind of what our reach is here. And um, I'm just gonna get started here and share my screen. And I'm gonna rely on Mickey to text me if for some reason things aren't working and I'm just cruising along. Um, get this started. Yeah, okay. So all I'm seeing now other than my slideshow is me on the, on the sidebar. So yeah, I'm just gonna start talking. And, and again, Mickey or mom, someone text me if this isn't working out. Um, yeah, so here's the Nighthawk on the beach. I, you'll learn maybe where this Nighthawk might be lounging with its moth teeny is what I'm calling this. And yeah, if you're familiar with the song, it's five o'clock somewhere. Really the spirit of this talk is just, uh, even if we're kind of down in the dumps or down in the snowstorm, wherever we are, um, some of our birds from Montana certainly are living a, a tropical and, and a warm life and hopefully you'll learn a little more about it. So grab a beverage, does not have to be alcoholic, but I am drinking some red wine as we talk, which can only mean this presentation is going to get better as we go along. So, oops, let me get started here. Okay, so here I am releasing a long-eared owl. Um, most of you know me from my work at the MPG Ranch, and I've, like Kay said, I've been involved with Spitter at Audubon. Gosh, I don't even want to say how many years at this point. Um, I also serve on the open land lands in this landscape that we love. And I'm a member of the Montana chapter of the Wildlife Society. It's just a professional organization here. So got lots going on, lots of things that I'm involved in, but I think I know most of you through Bitterroot Audubon. So the place I work is this MPG ranch. It's at the north end of the Bitterroot Valley, it's about 17,000 acres. Uh, technically our address is Florence and um, we stretch all the way up if you folks are in Missoula up into the reaches of Miller Creek. So on the south, kind of south hill, south end of Missoula. Um, it's all privately funded. We have a great uh, outside funder who believes in funding research and restoration activities. And uh, we spend literally millions of dollars every year um, on research projects. And part of my job there, as you'll hear, is some of our own original research. And then also implemented and of course reviewing that we're spending those millions well. And I think uh, hopefully I'll demonstrate to you tonight um, that we are spending our money well. Um, but before I really get started, since I have the soapbox here, uh, I wanna take a little time out because I think this is a great opportunity. I know most of you aren't scientists and don't get to handle birds all the time, like maybe I do. Um, but I really wanna emphasize that behind, you're gonna see some cool maps and the map. Um, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of hours of field work that's being done by a lot of different people, scientists and technicians. And I really wanna take a moment to acknowledge them. Um, these are wildlife professionals. They're applying their skills and their passion to further our collective knowledge of all these species for a conservation purpose. And so this work I'm sharing in this presentation 
it takes a person, <laughs> a certain type of person to put in the work to get this stuff done. And we're really lucky here um, in where we are in Western Montana, between MPG Ranch and some of the partners that I'm gonna highlight today, that we've got so many great people uh, working on behalf of wildlife. Um, but the other thing, so here's some of us working. The other thing I just want you to keep in mind is behind every line on the map is an individual creature like this poor will that's carrying a tracking device. And um, we have so many ways to kind of study and monitor wildlife, but using tracking devices is honestly one of the most invasive methods that we have and we use. And we know as professionals that anytime you try to capture and handle wildlife, there is always an inherent risk of injury or even death to that creature. And we also know that the whole process is stressful, um, both for the and, and more importantly, the, these, these birds that we're gonna talk about might carry this device we're, we're, we're looking at um, for months or even years. And so even though a lot of you might see these pictures and think that this is a, wow, working with wildlife is so fun and, and all of that, and it's amazing and it's a privilege, and, and it certainly is, um, please just understand that not everyone can go out and just do this work. Everyone that we're talking about um, today is permitted at both the state and the federal level. And to get those permits, we have to convince the authorities that we have the skills and the ethics to apply those that justifies the risk and stress to these individual animals. And so the weight of those responsibilities is really taken seriously by myself and everyone that I work with. And so I just hope that in addition to sharing just this basic information with you, you'll get a sense of how we work and how we have to work, um, type of questions we're asking, larger topic of bird conservation. Okay, so why birds and why now? This is also a little bit of a philosophical before we get into the, the meat of this uh, presentation. We all know it's been a super tough year. As you probably know, I've been going, we've all been going through a pandemic pandemic. I've been going through cancer treatments. Um, and there's just something to me that is still so just comforting about um, still. Um, there's certainly that comfort of routine um, for the birds you might see every day. I know I get up every morning and let the chickens out and wait for the song sparrow to pop up out from under the chicken coop. Um, there's always an element of surprise with birds, even though you think you might know what you see, might see, there's always something like an owl or something that might pop out. Um, and they offer us just such great, uh, just moments or nuggets to observe. And, you know, in the context of this talk, there's just always a lot to look forward to, you know, birds don't know about this particular pandemic and they're going around doing their things just like they do every year, whether it's sticking close to our homes or traveling really huge distances. And um, we have a lot to look forward to in terms of birds coming back. And I know I personally, I just can't wait for some of these species we're, we're talking about today to return to us. Let's see here. So I'm gonna start off, I guess maybe this isn't the best uh, structure for a talk, but um, with kind of like the big picture here and birds really, um, whether it's connecting us within this valley or to the larger world. So I'm gonna play this animation. Um, one of my colleagues, Eric Samso, put this together. I think his folks are on tonight and you should be so proud of Eric. Um, but this animation is actually outdated. Eric made it in 2019. Just so you get a sense of where we're going here. Um, this basically, we're looking at a view of the MPG Ranch and some of the dots you see here are the locations where we have captured some of the species who you're gonna see in this, in this great map. Everything from solid owls to catbirds, Cooper's hawks, eagles. So Eric's just taking us on a, these are all birds that have been 
tagged here in the Bitterroot Valley, most on the MPG Ranch, and just look at where those lines go. Pretty much the whole hemisphere. Here we're highlighting Osprey at first, over to some long-billed curlews. There's a group of hawks and falcons. You can see all the way to South America on some of these birds. Catbirds we're gonna talk a bit about later. The eagle work is something most of you are super familiar with from the work in the winter. And just so you can see here, here's the kind of data we can get from a transmitter on just one eagle. This one happens to be fairly resident, lives right up the road from Susanna McDougall up Skalkahoe Pass. We've seen it now for five years. We've even driven up to the lookout up Skalkahoe and seen the birds sitting up there. Here's the information we can get from a breeding male osprey. So you can see the kind of center there is his nest and we can see his exact fishing locations, the spots he likes to hang out. And yeah, and just to zoom back out. So just know, wow, I mean, look, uh, there's only a very small part of the United States and even North America that birds from the Bitterroot don't cover. And like I said, we're gonna, we have a lot of updating to do to this map and you're gonna see some of those results tonight. And so why back to the matter is most of the birds that uh, we see here in the breeding season and think of as our birds actually spend most of their time not here. And a lot of that time is in transit um, to an overwintering location. And we don't know a lot about some of our um, really common breeding birds. We don't know where they go. We don't know um, kind of what they're doing. And not all of those species, but quite a few of them are in decline. We are experiencing pretty major declines in species. And at this point in time, the kind of buzzword in the bird world is, is studying full annual cycles. So trying to figure out, put all the pieces together about where they are at all times of year so that if there is a, a decline or a conservation concern, uh, we as scientists can kind of isolate where that problem might be happening and you know, if it's possible or doable and take some action. We study migration in so many different ways. Some are active and some are passive. Um, tonight, we're just going to be talking about a handful, and most of these have to do with tracking devices. And I'm guessing most of you, at least those of you in the Bitterroot, are most familiar with this work um, done by Raptor View Research Institute on golden and now bald eagles. And this is just a picture of Tyler releasing a golden. Um, and these birds are mostly caught in the winter and actually a lot of them end up breeding Arctic. Today, we're gonna talk about some birds um, that are more common in our breeding here in the summer. And I'm not sure um, any of you have seen any of these results yet. So hopefully this is new info for you. We're gonna start with the turkey vulture. Um, it's a species we know very little about in the Intermountain West. Uh, people study their populations in other places. And in fact, in lots of places, people really don't like them. Um, they are seeing range expansion. In fact, the numbers even here in Montana are really picking up. Um, and maybe match what they used to be back in the day when people hunted bison and there were lots of carcasses and things on the landscape for them to eat. Um, we don't know much about where they breed in Montana. We have some basic ideas. We don't really know how they travel. And um, interestingly, from the methods perspective, is because we're not catching them on breeding territories, uh, we can't really even target exact birds or even birds that we know um, breed in Montana. And we first started seeing these guys popping up on our Winter Eagle project really early. I mean, this one's in March, it's still snowy, and they started coming to some of our carcass stations. For those of you that live in Hamilton or even in Missoula, um, there's a really nice and, and publicly accessible roost by the old funeral home in, in Hamilton and by the Coca-Cola bottling plant in Missoula. So we know we have um, communal roosts around the valley um, outside of the breeding season, more in the, on the, in the spring and the fall. And the thought was, let's get some tags on these and see where these birds are going. Um, to catch a vulture, couple methods. Uh, we were using a walk-in trap for the most part. And these are um, just a giant trap with a deer carcass inside and a, and someone's got to man it and like 
which it gets caught in there. And it's possible to get many birds at one time if they're all feeding in there together. And you can catch them in a way that's not very um, stressful or there's not a high risk of danger. Um, the other method for catching them, um, if you've seen Raptor View use, they're kind of explosive nets. Well, not really explosive, but they launch a net up and over a carcass where there's birds on them. They use this method a lot for eagles. Other people use it for grouse and turkeys. And here are two that were caught simultaneously at a site kind of out Mullen Road in Missoula. So it's the other way you can get vultures in hand. Um, they are kind of stinky. Um, they leak fluid from both ends. They're not the easiest bird to work with, but man, they are super, just super amazing. Here we, we did some work with, here's Colleen Powell. Uh, she let us work on her property um, down by Bull Crossing. And we also did some great outreach with the students at Florence Carlton High School. Here they are working with the vulture they named John Travolter who's been, we've been tracking him for several years and he appears to be breeding in the cliffs above the high school. Here's a little look at a transmitter. You can kind of see their little backpack style for these guys. Uh, they have a little solar panel that can charge them for several years and just depends on how um, much sun they get. And any of the devices we're talking about today, just know that the kind of standard rule of thumb is when you put anything on a bird, whether it's a tracking device or color bands, even it's um, USGS, that silver numbered band they get, um, all of the weight of that stuff has to come to 3% or less of their body weight um, to be appropriate. And it's great if you can even get it down lower than that. Also, Transmitters to birds are designed to break away. They're all materials that degrade over time. And in many cases, um, if the bird really isn't comfortable or doesn't, um, doesn't take to the transmitter well, they can pick them off. And in fact, that happened quite a bit with the turkey vultures. Um, some birds just pick them off almost immediately. So you can get a sense of where some of these birds go. Here's one bird. So I didn't name these K. I have not really named many birds. Um, I've named a few, but uh, because we have all this information up on a publicly accessible map, they needed names. So KIP is one um, that was tagged um, in September, um, this past September. And then by mid-October, he was down in the kind of southern Mexico, a journey of about 2,500 miles. If you're curious, um, this airstrip here is about two miles long. And I just did a rough polygon around where Kip likes to hang out in Oaxaca, and it's about 10,000 acres. Pretty big home range. Uh, they do like to just kind of glide around a lot. Um, but thanks to Google and these coordinates, you can really zoom in and see the kind of landscapes these birds are using. And this looks to me like a mix of kind of uh, second growth and primary growth forest. And then again, thank you, Google. You can kind of actually see what people have taken photos of and see what's on the ground in a lot of these places. Looks very lush and very, very different from Montana, both breeding grounds and potentially what this bird migrated through. Here's another one, Buddy, we've actually tracked for a couple years. Uh, I think he was initially named after the Lawrence Carlton High School superintendent that gave us access. Um, so thanks, bud. And uh, this bird actually is the farthest uh, south turkey vulture we have. He has gone 3,500 miles as uh, his wintering grounds in Nicaragua, and um, meaning he's traveled 100. Uh, you can see his tracks don't actually match up that well, but kind of vaguely for fall and spring. And um, this particular bird, um, I'm, I don't know if you can see my cursor. He actually was not a breeder in Montana. He looks like he might have bred in uh, Southern British Columbia. And how or why um, he was in Montana to be captured last spring, I don't know. Uh, but if we zoom in, his, his and Kip's about 2,000 acres, but what's super cool is that uh, he pretty much is using the exact same spot this winter that he did last winter. So great winter site fidelity for this particular bird. And if you look again, kind of a mix of uh, forest types here, probably roosting in the denser forest. And you can kind of get a look at what that landscape is like on the ground.
So what the cool thing is though, again, we couldn't target particular individuals. Um, you know, you kind of just got what you got, but what happens when you look at a bunch of these tracks from presumably unrelated birds? This is when it gets pretty cool. Um, of 19 transmitters out, here's all the tracks that we got. You can see kind of similar to our work with um, eagles um, who have kind of an eagle superhighway along the Rocky Mountain front in Montana. These birds uh, seem to have a nice superhighway on the uh, northern side of the Sierra Madres and then they, they switch over uh, near Veracruz and go on the southern side of that for the most part. There's always birds that do something a little bit different. If you zoom in, um, you can see the city of Veracruz. I know some of you here have gone to witness the river of raptors that passes by Veracruz, and you can see most of the vultures in our study actually pass through there along with 1.5 million of their friends. And so we know uh, vultures funnel through here just like a bunch of other raptors, but it's pretty cool to see the tracks actually tell us that too. And um, if you look at where these birds are right now, these dots are their lo current locations and they're all kind of on the edge, the southern edge of the Sierra Madres for the most part. So here's just a couple of the things just to recap. We've, what we've learned, they seem to have some fidelity to overwintering areas and the travel routes of at least the population that we're exposed to here in the Intermountain West are fairly concentrated with those from other places. Um, we have not had much luck in the breeding season locating nests. Um, they seem to wander a lot and uh, they do. We have gotten locations from them up in the canyons in the Bitterroot, but once they get up there, their signals um, don't work. Their transmitters don't work well. They're hanging out in the cliffs and it's just really hard to pinpoint their locations. And we'll see, time will tell us about range expansion really curious to see how far north some of these birds might eventually get. I'm going to switch gears. Done primarily by Raptor View Research Institute. This is a species we know quite a bit about. Anyone that's fishing or recreating in the summer along our rivers sees osprey. I think we have over 90 nests in the Bitterroot. Um, folks from the University, Eric Green and his lab have studied them along the Clark Fork and looked at things like heavy metal contamination. We don't necessarily have that problem here in the Bitterroot, um, but that's kind of how a lot of the osprey work got started. So they seem to be doing well here, at least from a breeding perspective, or at least uh, nests being occupied. What's great about them is that you can work from their nests or their breeding locations so you can target specific spots a specific um, individuals, so either the male or female, the parents and ages, so adult versus juvenile. And here's just a picture you can see of an osprey with a colored uh, leg, alphanumeric leg band that has been super helpful for uh, reciting osprey throughout this study uh, without using a transmitter actually. Um, but to catch an osprey, again, we're talking about fairly invasive, um, methods here. So it's just great to be upfront about it, but to keep these birds and their offspring safe. Uh, we use what's called a noose carpet over the nest. So they go in first and, and remove the eggs and put them in a cooler and put fake eggs in there. They put this noose carpet over it. So you can't really see on the wire mesh, but there's little nooses made out of fishing line that when the bird puts its leg through, it just slows. When that happens, that bird comes back to incubate. And then the crew rushes in with a bucket truck. So the nest needs to be fairly accessible in order to get there quickly. And then they're able to capture the bird. If that doesn't work, we've had this problem, particularly with male osprey that are less likely to be incubating. Um, they have used this technique with pushing, putting those same nooses on a fish. This fish did not die for the sake of the study. I think they bought it at the good food store and uh, put nooses on it. You float the fish down the stream with a float on it and you're in a raft and you just hope the osprey is hungry enough. And then you're right there um, fairly close to be able to get it with the net. And here these guys are with a successful capture. 
So here's an adult flying around with its satellite transmitter. There's the antenna. Uh, here's the pair at the nest. So in this case, they were able to get both male and female. And similarly with the young, they use a bucket truck to access the nest. Uh, when, the, when the young are fairly developed, but not quite able to fly yet because they don't want to bump them early out of the nest. And here's a couple of young birds getting their leg bands and their transmitters. And here's just some tracks. Um, you saw a little bit of this in Eric's um, animation, um, but you can see the adults are in blue, the nestlings are in red. They pretty much go all over the place to our south and they overwinter on both coasts of Mexico in the Gulf Coast of Texas, and they even go down into Central America. Um, the key thing here is that the, um, the birds do not and then the young leave and the males the last to go. They don't travel together, they don't overwinter together, but uh, fairly, it's not uncommon to have both male and female arrive back at their nests within a day or two of each other, uh, back up here in Montana and how they make that work, I can't say. And uh, the young birds, you'll see, there's a lot of clumps of locations at the south end. If you're not aware, young osprey spend their first entire year on their wintering grounds and then make their way back north. So again, they have high fidelity, super high fidelity to their breeding areas. That means they return every year, travel routes stay consistent and the same with the wintering grounds. Like I said, the families don't do anything together outside of the breeding season. Um, the young, uh, once they're gone, they're pretty much gone. Um, and one of the main lessons learned here is it's really, really tough to be a young osprey. So uh, Raptor View has now put transmitters on 46 um, young osprey. They've also color banded over 200. Only one osprey out of all of those with transmitters has made it to uh, breeding, like actual has it had a nest with babies. Um, and there's been no confirmed breeding um, from those more than 200 that were color banded. Um, you know, and that's a little more opportunistic. Those birds don't have trackers, so we're just relying on people seeing and reporting. Um, but that's pretty concerning, and I'm going to just Um, just in how they're dying, because people are always curious, that is one of the benefits of these transmitters is that when um, you suspect a mortality, you can actually go and try to figure out what happened. 17% um, of the nestlings never even left the bitter root. In fact, we've had a couple of them go north and hang out on the Blackfoot. They just never seem to know what to do. 36% um, of those nestlings died during their first fall journey. Um, and if that happened, they usually died pretty quickly within the first week or two. 17% of the nestlings died on their wintering grounds um, before their first spring journey north, um, before they were two and a half. And then 20% of the nestlings survived long enough to make it to spring migration. And then they returned to a place like uh, where Adam is here and somehow died uh, before being able to breed. And so in some cases like this particular bird, I think they suspected predation by a, uh, another raptor, a great horned owl or something like a goshawk. Um, we send people out in the field uh, again when possible. We have people that have searched and all over um, along their migratory route and even down in Mexico. Here's Jack Kirkley um, investigating a dead osprey nestling outside of or fledgling outside of Dillon. And in fact, over time, um, we have uh, Rob Dominich and Adam Shredding have called this the Bermuda Triangle of Osprey. So um, Missoula and the Bitterroot are just north of Salmon here. And, and we've had quite a few Osprey from the Bitterroot go down in this area. And so it just seems like it's a tough place or the birds just get so far and then they, they can't make it. Um, here's some of the other things we see. Sometimes, of course, there are humans involved. I think this is one. Uh, we had one that was killed or parts were found suspiciously in Darby River Park. So that bird didn't get very far at all. And uh, here's also, when you start to see uh, went wrong. And so this is actually in a town uh, somewhere in Mexico. So this was not one that we could find information out or recover. But in any case, um, I know that's all sad, but that's part of what we learned. Um, this is the national where the currently where we have Osprey with transmitters. 
These are all um, young birds. Um, they're working primarily with uh, fledglings now. We've learned it from adults. We don't need to bother them anymore. Um, and I'm gonna zoom in on Avery. He's in pink, she's in pink here on this map. Um, Avery is the one um, bird, one young bird that has made it. Um, and we have seen um, breeding and we think out of all the osprey ever studied in North America, which is two or 300 young birds that have had transmitters. This is the first one that anyone has ever documented breeding. Um, maybe it's not a big deal for most people, but it's a huge deal for, um, for Raptor View um, to, to contribute to that. And this bird, even though it was born in the Bitterroot, it ended up breeding over in the Paradise Valley. And um, for those of you that know Marco Rastani, who now works for Northwest Energy, he was the one um, that was able to go and document Avery at her nest and he banded her babies. Um, but anyway, Avery now is on the Gulf Coast, again near Veracruz. So if we're all looking for places to go, it sure seems like Veracruz is a place we should all travel to. Um, you can kind of zoom in and see some of the nice wetlands Avery is hanging out at. And uh, here's the beach. I know it's kind of blurry, but anyway, we wanted some beach shots and some palm trees and Avery's doing that for us. Sorry, I'm having a cat interruption here. Okay, cool. We're going to move on from Osprey. I hope you guys are enjoying it. I'm just going to take a sip here. Talk about long-billed curlews. This is a project that we've worked on with um, mostly Jay Carlisle out of Boise State University and the Intermountain Bird Observatory. Um, this is a little bit of a different story from the osprey. We know long-billed curlews aren't doing well like many grassland birds. It's a species in decline across its range. And here in Montana, it's a species of concern um, as designated by Fish, Wildlife and Parks in our heritage program. And um, there's been some work done on them, but we really, really don't know much about their population status in the bitter in particular. And part of that is probably because they mostly occur in private lands. They like um, grasslands and uh, you know things that for us would be maybe the cattle ranches and other farms and agricultural properties that are kind of away from the valley bottom, but not up to the forest. And um, which is kind of great. They actually can do very well with cattle and other agricultural uses because they like um, kind of kind of really short vegetation. Um, and like the osprey, though, we can target individuals in specific areas for research purposes. So we're not just out there randomly catching curlews. Really cool. They don't make a ton of a big nest, uh, but they're nesting on the ground. They have these fairly large kind of greenish um, brown speckled eggs and um, they will, they mostly stay, they like to stay out in the open, they like to see things. Um, they're usually on um, open areas, sometimes they're on prominent places like this. And for those of you who have been near uh, Curly with a nest, you know, very quickly, a very calm bird turns into something like this and they may even attack you. Um, they can be fairly aggressive around their nests, which is problematic for them in some places as we'll hear later. Um, but um, Jay and his crew um, had questions about where the curlews in the Intermountain West were going. We kind of had an idea of where the ones to the east of us were going in the winter and where the ones to the west of us, but Intermountain West is kind of unknown. So he started working um, on mostly private lands in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. And so we fit into his um, research strategy. And um, these are hard, they are really hard to work with, or they proved very hard for us here in the Bitterroot. Um, you find their nests by watching for incubation switches at dawn and dusk, the male and the female switch. And there's can be sometimes a very brief, um, some vocalization and then they switch and they're gone. And so if you turn to look away for a couple of minutes or even a couple of seconds, you can miss it. It can be really hard to see otherwise. The curlew in this picture is right there. We're gonna zoom in and there she is sitting low. And so they often can blend in really well to the landscape around them. Uh, to catch them once you find the nest, you, the nest is on that distant hill. You have folks set up with spotting scopes uh, to pinpoint the nest uh, to some other people because really they can be so hard to see from feet away. And if you flush the bird off the nest before you're ready to catch it, 
you've essentially blown it for the day and you may have blown it for the entire study. So it's a bit high pressure. Um, again, these folks are using a mist net, um, not holding the mist net, how most of you are probably familiar with using mist nets. This one is a super long, I can't even remember how long this is, um, net held horizontally. And these guys are gonna walk and be directed by people using spotting scopes towards the nest. And it's just this giant setup and you have your fingers crossed the whole time for success. So these guys are in contact with the folks um, on the scope. The people are on the scope are telling them take 10 steps to the right, 10 steps to the left. And what they're trying to do is get that net centered over the top of the curlew on the nest. And they just lay the net on top. Uh, so she doesn't even know what's happening and hopefully catches her. And here you go, here's the moment of capture. And they were successful here. So again, you can see um, in this particular instance, almost no vegetative cover. Um, really lucky to get this bird. And they're just being as careful as possible because they do have a nest there with eggs. Here she's getting her uh, unit. And then what Jay does and what we often do anytime you put transmitter on birds, he actually likes to put them in a little tent for a while and make sure that they're moving and, and behaving kind of normally that that transmitter and the harness aren't inhibiting the bird's movement at all um, prior to release and just give it a few minutes up to 10 minutes or so just to make sure everything's working out. And so this is pretty cool. Here's uh, all the birds that were transmitted here in Montana um, in the Bitterroot Valley. Um, you can see to our surprise, I guess, or maybe not surprise, um, our birds here overwintered in two different spots, um, somewhere in the Central Valley of California, and then others were just down south of the Salton Sea in kind of the Mexicali area, so it's kind of spanning the California-Mexico border. Here's Susan Nelson, our star curlew volunteer, down in the corner. Um, she's releasing JY. Um, this bird was caught up in the Three Mile area. And um, this is a bird that kind of went down in the south end of the Central Valley and was tracked for, I think, two or three years. And I think this bird just died recently, either in spring migration and I think from coyote predation. Um, and what gets cool here is when we combine what we know here in Montana um, with the other birds in Jay's study. And so the birds from Montana are purple, um, birds from Idaho and birds from Wyoming. Um, so Montana birds split between the two overwintering areas and the two other populations Jay has worked with. And what's kind of cool about this, again, when you get down to these overwintering areas, you might have a field with thousands and thousands of curlews in that field. Um, if you can imagine if someone decided to shoot them or if some other kind of disaster occurred, um, you could wipe out a ton of curlews at once. Um, when they have different overwintering destinations like this, that means any uh, challenge or problem that they have in any one overwintering area may not um, have a huge detrimental effect on the population, the breeding population from wherever you're concerned about. Like us in the bitter. Um, and just to zoom in a little bit more on the left here, um, you know, for those of you that are familiar with um, this part of California, these birds are, you know, just south of Fresno, um, overlapping sometimes into the same exact field with birds from Idaho. And similarly, um, on the right, uh, our birds, again, in purple, mostly overlapping with birds from Idaho, but also ones from Wyoming. And this is the kind of landscape they're using. I thought this was, I've always been kind of fascinated by the Salton Sea. And of course, there's huge, huge issues with that. Um, area. Um, it's a fantastic haven for birds, but water is critical and super controversial because agriculture is so important in this area. Um, but anyway, this is the kind of landscape these birds are hanging out in. I was very curious to see what mullet island is all about, um, as I myself had a mullet until two days ago when I decided to cut my own hair. Um, but anyway, it looks like some interesting places to check out. And if you even zoom in, there is a place called Curlew um, south of the Salton Sea. Um, but you can see again, primarily agricultural land, um, not a lot of topography and probably lots of great things for those curlews to be eating in the ag fields. 
Um, here's just interesting take uh, north and south of the border. You can certainly see that water is more available because <laughs> everything is greener north of the border, um, much drier on the south side. Um, but again, here's another bird, and I apologize this for the color here. This was not my map. Um, this is another bird that was tagged up in the three mile. It's the only act bird still um, with a satellite transmitter that's still active and still alive in this project from the Bitterroot. So JE was tagged. I think Susan helped with this bird too, up in the three mile area. And he is see down here um, in Mexico, south of Mexicali. And you can zoom in a little bit more. Lots of really dry looking ag land. Of course, this could just be the satellite imagery that was available. Maybe it's not dry all the year round, but just look at this. So probably grain fields, lots of things for probing around with that giant beak between bugs and, and seeds to eat. So just a little summary on these guys. Um, our birds here over winter in multiple areas and they overlap with other populations. They have some fidelity to travel routes, some fidelity to breeding sites though. We did find that some of our birds moved out of the valley and one I think ended up breeding in the Ruby Valley after one year in the Bitterroot. Um, we're certainly, for those of us that have our eye on curlews are seeing few fewer around. And so um, that's just a plea if anyone out there knows of great curlew populations or knows of any, um, I don't know, outreach or engagement we can do with folks. Again, there um, it would be nice to know where they are um, because they do are compatible with grazing and other agricultural activities. It doesn't necessarily mean a big um, burden on a landowner to have them. And there are just certain times of year, particularly when they're nesting, that it's great to give them some space or give them, um, you know, their own their own time. So um, the other great thing about this research, um, because Jay in particular has been so good with outreach, um, this is now a giant multi-state project and multinational. Um, he's got folks um, in all these critical places on the ground in Mexico. Um, people are working to do um, monitoring and just figuring out what's going on and to protect some habitat in Mexico. He's expanded now into British Columbia and also has tagged some birds in New Mexico and some other places in Montana. Uh, when we started to not have much luck here in the Bitterroot, just because the densities were so low, it just wasn't efficient to try to keep track tracking them here. Um, he did some work down and has worked over in the big hole. So for folks that like um, curlews, that's a great place to go. Uh, the densities still seem to be pretty high over there. Um, the other big thing they've identified, at least in Idaho, um, they have seen a 90% decline in the areas that they've studied curlews over the past 40 years. So that's huge. Um, and 30% of the birds that got transmitters in Idaho have been shot on the breeding grounds. And so they are also doing try to reduce that um, mortality because that's a big bummer and it's super preventable. Um, and just maybe we need some education and time with people. But again, we really don't know what's going on in Montana and here in the Bitterroot. So again, if folks are interested or have more info on curlews around here, other than the three mile area and kind of where we've worked up on NPG, um, there just aren't a lot of reports or sightings or any information about curlews. Okay, we're gonna shift and get a little bit tinier now because um, it's not all about the big birds uh, and talk a little bit about the gray cat bird. Um, this is another bird, you know, it appears to be doing fairly well in Montana. It appears, it appears to be doing fairly well without it uh, throughout its range. It, you know, it breeds across North America. So even those of you who aren't from Montana, probably familiar with cat birds. Um, we just don't have a lot of info on their Western populations. Um, and even though they appear to be abundant, they, at least for us, are almost always associated with riparian habitat. Um, and maybe not always riparian in other places, but shrubby. Um, we have a lot of concern here over the loss of riparian habitat. So like the curlews, um, almost all the riparian habitat we have is on private lands. You think about um, the Bitterroot River and everything around it. Um, and so there's a lot of potential, depending on how people use that land or choose to use that land, to lose this shrub cover, whether it's 
from grazing or fire or whatever. Um, and also we're in drought and um, dry conditions might continue. And so we're not always confident that that habitat will be here long term. Um, the work with catbirds that I'll talk about is mostly accomplished by the University of Montana's Bird Ecology Lab. And here's Megan Filling here uh, working with the catbird. And we'll also have some data here from Kristen Mancuso from University of British Columbia Okanagan campus. And this work here, uh, we're talking about, again, little transmitters, uh, two different types, geolocators, which kind of record uh, daylight, uh, basically light levels, and you can interpret latitude and longitude from that information. And then they also used some, what are called pinpoint GPS units. They're little tiny units that can record just a, a handful, maybe up to 20 points that you program um, to the unit to be recorded through whatever uh, time cycle you want. Um, the downside with these, and again, this is all because these birds are so tiny, they can't carry a giant transmitter that has a power source and a stored or a way to beam information. In order to get this info, you have have to recapture the bird. So it's best to do this type of work with a bird that you think or can predict will return to the same area and cat birds um, generally do that. So um, this is work mostly with mist nets and maybe sometimes audio lures, but you set your nets up in shrubby areas and uh, try to catch the cat birds. And this is really cool. This is part of Kristen's um, PhD. PhD or master's, I can't remember. Um, but so she was tagging and working with birds in Southern British Columbia. Here we are working with birds in blue from the Bitterroot. And uh, much to all of our surprise, they both not only had kind of the same travel path, but instead of flying down maybe through the Intermountain West or hitting the Pacific Flyway, they flew way east and hooked into the Central Flyway. And ultimately, most of them landed in Southern Texas and then along the coast of Mexico. Um, this is really different. Going to Florida and Cuba. And then birds in the Midwest, we're going to Southern Mexico and even down into Central America. So all of these birds have very different wintering grounds, but our two Western populations are going to the same place. If you zoom in a little bit, Kristen made these nice maps. You can see that are overlapping in their overwintering range and in some places uh, really clustered in some parts of Mexico. So you can see if we were concerned about where catbirds are going or what they're doing in the winter, uh, this part of Mexico would be a place uh, to investigate. And here's just a little bit of what it looks like on the ground. Pretty fairly mixed use, uh, looks kind of developed for agriculture. Um, but all of these birds, uh, when we pinpointed their locations, were using shrubs here just like they do um, in their breeding season. Here's just a couple pictures of the lush landscape. It looks like a great place to go. So both populations took a really far Eastern route. Um, they used the same routes in the fall of spring, Rocky Mountains crossing the mountain range, not a problem. Um, they used the really isolated, uh, if you think about some parts of the central flyway, um, there aren't a ton of riparian areas or shrubby cover, but the catbirds use those um, there and on the wintering grounds. Um, interestingly, the individuals, when they tracked individual birds, they actually had multiple, many of them had multiple locations where they overwintered. So they'd stick around in one spot and then they'd move to another and then they'd move to another. Um, one bird had a, a four different overwintering spots and each time it moved farther south. Um, they had high, our two populations had high overwintering overlap, particularly in a couple of those spots in Mexico, which is really interesting and helps us from a conservation perspective. Differences in our populations in BC and in Montana. Uh, for example, in breeding success, which we actually do, uh, the, the birds in Montana seem to have lower breeding success than the ones in BC. Um, if they're both overwintering the same spot, we might uh, hypothesize that that, um, that that difference in breeding success is not being caused by, the, by what's happening on the wintering grounds, that it's actually a problem on the breeding grounds. And so that's a question these folks are still um, exploring. Okay, I'm gonna take another time out here 
because I think at this point, um, well, first of all, I need a drink of water. But I've presented a lot of really great info and you're probably wondering, well, Kate has a lot of great research partners, but what does Kate actually do herself other than talk about other people's work? Um, I do a lot of supervising, here I am. This is the Northern Pygmyal uh, <laughs> tactical unit. Um, we do a lot of things on the ground wearing cats. So see me out in the field with the Winter Eagle Project, wearing my official jumpsuit and Bernie actually joined us this day. But in all actuality, I actually do a lot of work um, in the field that will contribute to this talk. Um, unfortunately, I work with a lot of species where um, things like satellite transmitters and those pinpoint units uh, just don't work for whatever reason. Um, it might be like this poor whale on the left. They're just too small. Um, this guy might weigh 60 grams. He's just too tiny to put a lot of those big units on. Um, in the middle, we have a Lewis's woodpecker, who we did try putting pinpoints on, um, but they ended up, and, and as we've learned, they have very, very low site fidelity. We have high turnover every year, and so even though we have woodpeckers all over the place, it's not the same birds, and so if you're counting on those birds coming back to retrieve a unit, um, it doesn't work so well. And then we have birds like the northern sawwood owl, that are very numerous and you might want to put out a bunch of tags and uh, those other units are just too expensive. Some satellite units can be to three to five thousand dollars plus thousands of dollars a year in satellite fees. And so uh, if you want to, if your research question requires working with a bunch of animals, um, that might just be out of your price range. So um, that leads us to um, kind of where we're at now and some newer um, newer technology and infrastructure and kind of communal sciencing that we're doing here in the Bitterroot um, that we at MPG have started with our partners. And that has to do with the MODIS wildlife tracking system. So um, it's a pretty simple co concept. I'll kind of walk you through it. It was started by Birds Canada and um, it basically is a communal network um, that started pretty much in the Northeast and in Canada, but basically all it, all it is is a uh, group of uh, basically automated receiver stations. So just think antenna and a bunch of um, tags. So it's kind of like traditional radio telemetry where you have a, uh, an antenna that's picking up a signal from, um, from a unit or a tag. Um, the difference here is that in traditional radio telemetry, every organism that you're working with has a different frequency that it's emitting a signal of. And that's how you tell who is who. For this, we have a bunch of stations spread out all over the place and they all receive on one frequency. And the way we tell individuals apart is kind of like a Morse code. There's kind of like a, um, just a difference in, in the signal. Um, so every, every tag in this system is, is using the same um, frequency. It's just, it's kind of pulse is a little different and allows us to still track individual birds what this looks like on the landscape. Well, first of all, it's kind of aimed at allowing us to study small, small things. So these tags, if you've heard the phrase nano tag, um, that applies to the tags used in the MODIS system. So nano just kind of meaning tiny. Um, these tags can be small enough to be put on something like a monarch butterfly or a dragonfly. You could in theory use them for elk if you wanted a cheap way um, to study a bunch of elk and didn't want to spend money on radio collars. Um, so it allows you to track both long and short distance movements of animals on all sizes, but the focus is really on the small. And in all honesty, most people are using this to kind of track where birds move kind of over long distances. And again, here's just a little bit of a look at the tags. They look a lot like uh, the normal radio telemetry tags we have used on some of these birds in the past. Um, some of them are even a little bit like stickers. We work with two companies, um, low tech and cellular tracking technologies. These tags are much cheaper. We're talking maybe a couple hundred dollars, much tinier. Again, you can be putting need to retrieve them. All they're doing is beaming their radio frequency. Some even have solar panels, teeny solar panels, so they can 
in theory be a life tag uh, for the life of the bird. Um, but you don't get that kind of pinpointed uh, use of a landscape. All you're getting is kind of the detection at a station. And, um, you know, if the bird is in the same area for many days in a row, you know that, but it's not as easy to kind of pinpoint um, exact activity. Here's kind of what a station looks like. This is kind of like our heavy duty one at the ranch. Um, it's got four directional Antennas have a range of 12 to 15 miles each based on topography. So they cover huge areas. Um, they are powered by a solar panel and there's a battery and then there's a little computer at the bottom that's storing all the info as it comes in and then taking it from an analog to digital signal. I can't remember if I got that backwards, but anyway, it's storing the data. Um, they don't have to be crazy units like that. In fact, some of these look like the kind of Yagi antennas uh, some of you out there may have used to track um, birds and other wildlife by hand. They can be mounted onto buildings. Um, we've got one on the American Prairie Reserve in the upper left that's just on kind of like a, a storage thing. And then in the lower right, that's the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise, just a little unit right on the roof. And then for those of you that know or bird out at Warm Springs, uh, we work with Atlantic Richfield Company and there's a, now there's a MODIS station out on those two really ugly, uh, I shouldn't call them ugly, just, but anyway, those two giant silos, which are the only thing up in that whole Warm Springs area, um, now have a little MODIS station on top. And this is what the coverage looks like. When we started, um, this was in 2018, you can just see um, just dots all over the map in the Northeast. For those of you from Pennsylvania, you can see a lot of Pennsylvania pride, Pennsylvania. And actually I think it was the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. Um, they worked to get one of the first kind of all state transects. So no bird with a tag is getting through Pennsylvania without getting detected. Um, it was a real model for other folks in other places. And surely um, this kind of communal um, system has shown that once you get a few stations up in certain areas, other people just can kind of jump in and add on. So the way this works is that all these uh, dots here are all receiving stations. Uh, we all share the data that's collected. So if I, um, if I tag a bird here in Montana and gets picked up somewhere else, I get notified of that detection and so does the person um, that kind of runs the station. And so we have to agree that that info is public. Now, of course, we can kind of publish on the research questions, but um, this is all uh, kind of to be shared and you sign kind of public sharing agreements when you enter into this system. Um, but you can see for sure, for those of us in the West, there's really was not much going on in 2018. And in fact, this just giant hole in the Intermountain West. So we started a project at MPG. We knew we had great researchers here and people that worked with animals. We knew we had some funding and initiative to start getting some stations up. And so we started this Intermountain West Collaborative MODIS project to try to get coverage out here. And uh, you can kind of see in blue, we, this is what we've accomplished. It's close to 25, I think almost 30 stations, a uh, big clump in the Bitterroot. And then along the Snake River Plain, we were trying to anticipate where our birds might go and try to get a transect along that part of Idaho. A couple of random dots. Uh, we got a couple out, one in uh, American Prairie Reserve out in central Montana. We have a dot out in southeastern or Oregon with Klamath Bird Observatory. And then we have a sister property in Wisconsin. So there's a random dot in Wisconsin. But just so you can see what the coverage is like here in the Bitterroot, we have a bunch of stations up on MPG. Um, we have been hosted, um, we're so grateful uh, to the Tom Reed at Lee Metcalf National Wildlife Refuge. Sam Lowry and staff down at the teller. And then we've got Barb Garten down here at the bottom. Thanks, Barb. And thanks to all the other hosts. Um, you know, all it takes is a uh, at the teller, they just had a random telephone pole that had nothing on it. And we stuck some antennas and there you go. You got a motor station. And again, no bird with a tag is getting through that part of the valley without getting picked up. Um, those little kind of ears that are coming off the stations are basically it's projected coverage. 
Um, and there's certainly an interplay here between putting stations up and deploying tags. No one wants to deploy tags in a place that doesn't have any stations. And it's hard to get people to put stations up if no one is deploying tags. So part of our strategy has been working with some partners like those dots on the map in Oregon and Eastern and Central Montana um, is just to gar start getting stations. And once people start getting cool hits on their stations from birds from elsewhere, it really builds momentum and, and um, the kind of light orange uh, on this map here is kind of projected um, stations some of our partners will put up in the next year. Dark orange is where we're hoping to work. So really filling in that I-15 corridor. Um, and in Montana, um, Fish and Wildlife Service and American Prairie Reserve through the Smithsonian will be working on that stuff in central kind of Northeast Montana. Fish, Wildlife and Parks has um, been expressing some interest. I think their first station is gonna go up on Montana Wild in Helena. And I think we're working on one with Montana Audubon out at the Billings um, Education Center. Um, so we're doing a lot of planting seeds. Um, the white dots on the map are other partners. Uh, these great walls of, of receivers are going up all across uh, what's called the Great Plains Chihuahuan Desert Initiative. I think if you look south, you can see we've got partners working in Mexico. And then we are also working in orange here on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec to again, any bird that's uh, traveling terrestrially through Mexico into Central America um, should get detected at one of these receiving stations. Whew. Hey, just so you can see, here's the cool part and I'm kind of wrapping up, so thank you. Lines here. These are the birds I've tagged. So again, if you're concerned that I'm not really doing any work here, I tagged 45 solid owls this fall. Um, I did have some help, but I was there for every tag. Um, again, Lewis, things like Lewis's woodpeckers, no one's ever tagged those before. Um, certainly no one else in North America is working with poor wills. Um, lots of work with night hawks, um, so, but they are super hard to catch. And then our, and our friends at um, the Bird Ecology Lab and then the Bruner Lab, Jolie De Simone and, uh, at University of Montana, they worked with a lot of the passerines, the songbirds, the perching birds. So everything from brown-headed cowbirds down to pine siskins. And wow, Jolie put out a lot of tags on pine siskins. So just again, these, this is mostly work with mist nets, particularly for those songbirds. This mist net is between two big shrubby clumps where you could might passively catch a cat bird or you might use an audio lure um, to try to, to lure a bird in. Here is my friend Debbie setting up nets. This, these were nets targeting solid owls during migration this fall. So we were using kind of tree cover to hide the nets and we used an audio lure. And then here's two sets on the left is me getting super excited to catch, try to catch a night hawk, which are very, very hard to catch. Uh, and I had nets set up. Their breeding sites are often on ridgetop. Right. Um, I have nets set way in the distance for common poor wills, um, which are much easier to catch than night hawks, but both species were using audio lures to try to get them in. And in some cases, little decoy cardboard birds or even um, taxidermy birds. Lewis's woodpeckers, it took us, gosh, again, when we talk about the thousands of hours, it took us six years to figure out different ways to catch Lewis's woodpeckers. And we ended up modifying the traps we use for hummingbirds and um, using whatever feeder people were using and working with the public. Uh, this is at Mimi Sauer's place before she moved. Um, and gosh, you know, a pileated woodpecker study would be great too. But anyway, this is a great method because you're only trapping the bird that you want. And it basically, there's a string, kind of like that drop down trap for the turkey vulture, super high tech. You just have a person <laughs> release the uh, release it and the net drops down when you want to catch the bird. And here's the Lewis's that was going for suet and uh, William, my coworker. Small songbirds. Um, Jolie's holding a pine siskin here, a lash live bunting, brown headed cowbird. A catbird and a spotted toey, just so you get a sense of what these birds look like. And again, expecting to migrate, you know, in the fall, or we capture them in the fall. And, you know, it looks like a lot of dots on the map, 
But then when you think about how huge the world is and how tiny those birds are, um, it's a wonder at all that we got any detections, but we got detections. So I know it doesn't look like many dots, but I'll just walk you through here for poor wills are in purple. Again, a dot here on the MPG ranch. We got one poor will down uh, just south of us along the Snake River in Idaho. Another poor will was picked up in Northeast Colorado. Nighthawks, we're gonna talk a bit about, or more later, but just look super Eastern route all over Florida and all the way down to Columbia. Gray catbirds, kind of like we were thinking or what we already knew from that other data, took an Eastern route and got picked up here and then down the Gulf Coast of Texas. Saw Waddell, just one out of 45. Crazy pine siskins though. Uh, we got one in Northeast Colorado, but then look at these guys over here in Michigan captured in late summer here in Montana would go so far east and let's fingers crossed we get them picked you know picked up in all those other stations out there soon and then lastly Swainson's thrushes these guys were captured during migration so we don't know exactly where they came from but given what we see right here we've got one that was detected up in British Columbia others in Missouri Texas, and then again, way down in Columbia itself. And Swainson's thrushes are, are pretty cool. Um, looks like they're taking the same path as catbirds and you can see kind of what information we can gather, even though we don't know that these are, uh, we, these are unrelated birds, but you can start to see how you can piece to get together these detections and get a pretty good idea of what routes might be for some of these species. So um, for these guys, yeah, it looks like they're taking a central flyway approach, but in terms of how they get to Columbia, are they going over land or over water? We know birds, songbirds can do both. Um, so that's a question that we hope maybe we'll answer with more stations down in Mexico and Central America. And again, we don't know exactly where all these birds are breeding, but uh, the story of this one bird uh, might give us some clues. Now, remember, we put out a bunch of tags and we're hoping for detections of our birds and other stations. And meanwhile, our stations are sitting here waiting for birds from other places to get detected. And we've gotten all sorts of cool things from Western sandpipers to things like these swains and thrushes. So the Delmore Lab, Texas a and I think they put close to And um, this particular bird left the 1st of September and was picked up in this wall, this modus array um, in British Columbia on the 29th. And then we picked it up on three different stations along the Snake River Plain the night of the 6th of October. So that's pretty cool. It suggests there's a little bit of a flyway for swains and thrushes in addition to this particular bird uh, these the birds from this project are getting picked up all over by our stations. So in two, st two seasons, um, and our bitter stations, uh, and that includes actually bitter stations, and then we picked up a bird from this study on the American Prairie Reserve in central Montana. Also from the study, this one bird at three stations in Idaho, and then um, again, our wacky um, sister station in Wisconsin got three different birds from the Swainson's thrush study at its one station. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then also cool that one station in Columbia picked up both Swainson's thrushes of ours and nighthawks. Um, and here's kind of what it looks like on the ground. Again, when you zoom in, it's pretty mixed. In fact, it looks like a lot of kind of second growth forest patchy agriculture. Again, that doesn't really necessarily reflect what these birds are using, but it does reflect what they're passing through. And for nighthawks, we were way surprised. So if we were surprised at the Eastern route of things like catbirds and swains and thrushes, wow, these nighthawks went even farther east. Um, the one in Indiana actually hung out in the area for five days, so it even did a little stopover um, before it took off, but it looks to us like they were going way far east and down the coast of Florida, so it, they likely crossed some pretty big water to get down to Columbia. And so it looks like a very, very easterly route, 
and it actually is similar to the routes that lots of other nighthawks from populations to our west and our east are taking. Literally the nighthawk that got picked up on the station in Columbia. That's literally my hand and literally my nighthawk or that nighthawk. Uh, that went to Columbia. And that to me is just mind blowing to put that all together and to think that here uh, close to uh, Memorial Day, when we start getting Nighthawks back in Montana, that I'll very likely run into this guy again. So again, the, one, the wonder of birds. Um, here's a little bit what it looks like uh, off the coast of Florida. So again, a, palm, a few palm trees were promised. Here they are. But also keep in mind when these birds were flying in the fall, it's also uh, hurricane season. And all of these heard right at the same time, there were some pretty big hurricane, uh, pretty big hurricane activity this year. So, uh, you know, clearly these, these, this is not new for these birds. They've dealt with hurricanes before. Evolution has dealt with hurricanes before, uh, but fingers crossed um, that they most of them make it. Okay, I'm just gonna close with a couple of mysteries. Again, the sawwood owl is a big mystery. Um, so keep in mind, here's all our stations and we had a pretty good wall to our south. And of course, um, some stations around us, but we put transmitters on 45 sawwits and 47 Lewis's woodpeckers. And this was the only detection of those two species we caught was one owl. And so what that says to us is, uh, we need to fill in some gaps here um, that we don't know exactly where these birds are going. Of course, we're learning a lot in this process. I guess it's possible that somewhere in the Frank Church wilderness, there's like hundreds of thousands of saw wet owls holed up for the winter and they didn't actually go south. Uh, but we know from our other telemetry work that saw wets cross both the sapphires and, and the bitterroots and their path. So we know we have owls going both directions and we just need to fill in the gaps, maybe a little more directly east and west of us to pick those birds up. Lewis is for sure. I mean, we know we don't get them back. A uh, bird that breeds here one year is not likely to come back the next year. And um, we don't know where these birds go for breeding and we don't really know well for overwintering. Again, here's, sorry, here's us filling in the gap. Um, for Lewis's, we did get one pinpoint that we retrieved several years ago that showed it overwintering in Northern California. And so that's what we suspect they do, but they also overwinter even as far um, east as Utah. So it's possible those birds are out there, but we really hope with this kind of, I don't know, um, I call it the Snake River Smile, but now that it's uh, expanding up this way, maybe it's just the Snake River Sneak. Um, once we get this kind of wall filled in here and our partners start working to our west, we'll have a much better idea of where these birds are going. But yeah, I just think, I just wanted you to see the beauty of, here's a Lewis's woodpecker, how far these birds' wings are taking them um, and the places they go and the mysteries that are still out there. And um, I know I personally can't wait for spring migration uh, 2021 to see where some of these birds uh, pop up and uh, whether they pop up on a station in Missouri or Texas um, or back on their breeding grounds in Montana. So I think with that, whew, that was a lot. That was a lot of info, a lot of talking. And I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, it's always great to close out with an owl because why not? Um, but really thank my colleagues and co-workers at MPG Ranch and then our wonderful, wonderful partners that did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, so folks at Boise State, Raptor View Research Institute, the Bruner Lab, uh, Kristen up in Canada, and then the folks at Bird Ecology Lab at the University of Montana. So I think with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, if you have questions, I don't know, I guess I was supposed to say, maybe put them in the chat and Mickey would help facilitate. Um, so maybe try that. There are, um, there, are, uh, there are some questions, oh Kate. Jeez, um, oh wow, okay. Uh, well, not a lot of questions, but the first question from Melissa, I have heard in other presentations about turkey vultures in California that were breeding, nesting within hollow trees in oak woodlands in very old snags where the nest was basically on the ground but still with a standing hollow tree around it. 
I found it to be a fascinating nesting strategy. Is there any future planned research to determine their nesting sites here in the Bitterroot? That's a great question, Melissa. And I was just going to say too, people can feel free to turn their videos on now. That might be nice for me to have a sense that I wasn't just talking to myself for an hour. Um, great question, Melissa. Um, so um, I mentioned this and I can certainly send you some info. Um, Raptor View has made some attempts to try to figure out where the signals are coming from, but in general, the thought is, at least in the Bitterroot, that they're on the west side, at least the birds that they've tracked, they're in the canyons, they're on ledges or in kind of clay, caves or cliffs, and the problem there is that the signal has a hard time, first of all, the solar panels have a hard time charging, the birds aren't in a place where they're getting sun. And then when they do send signals, the signals are really scattered and sucky and it's hard to pinpoint. Um, I think that would be a great tangent from Raptor for Raptor guardians or folks that want to kind of have an adventure is to try to figure out some of those sites. They're just super hard to hike to. They're not easy to get in on, you know, you're, you might be repelling to get your eyes on something, but maybe with a scope from the bottom. Um, it might be possible, but I should send you some maps. The, the scatter of the plot of the points coming from the transmitters is pretty wide. It's not like a really nice tight, um, tight point, but we're thinking they're, they're basically using cliffs here. Oh, hi, Max. I can see you. <laughs> um, Kate Christie wants to know how close does a bird have to be to I assume it's a modus station to get picked up by it. Great question. So how close? Well, um, the the one directional antenna uh, can be 12 to 15 miles. So the radius around a modus station can be up to 30 miles if there's no kind of topography or trees or something obstructing it. Um, so that's super powerful. Um, but just, and Christy, I know you know a lot about telemetry. When you have a detection distance that is that long, and then if you are interested or concerned about kind of fine scale movement, it gets kind of harder to pinpoint, but we can pinpoint directly in an area. You can also um, kind of figure out travel rates as well as direction. Good question. Um, Everything else on here are not questions. They're just uh, saying thank you and how interesting it was and how wonderful you are. But one thing that did not sound so great from Bill and Barb is they think their main Lewis woodpecker nesting tree came down in the big winds lately. Super wet. Yeah. That's a problem. When we talk about conserving riparian habitat, you know, it takes hundreds of years to build a snag, a cottonwood snag on the floodplain. So when we lose those and we don't have any cottonwoods regenerating, it's a, uh, it's a sad plight for the future. But Bill and Barb, just remember uh, your woodpeckers that you had this year and the year before have moved on to whoever knows where that we'd love to know. And the new woodpeckers arriving may have no sense of the loss. So even though you're you're losing them, um, and that's a bummer. You could always put up a nest box, though. I suspect you'll get starlings and not Lewis's woodpeckers. Well, thank you very much, Kate. That was fascinating. Um, and thank, thank you, everybody who oh, came to listen to Kate. How Thanks about everybody listening. turn on their sound and we'll all clap. Yay. Yes, put on your sound and clap. Yay. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. I, I hope we'll see a lot of you next month. We're going to have, a, a, the program's going to be a little different. There are going to be three artists talking about the ties between nature and art wow. in their own work. But, yeah, why does it? Will that be on Zoom? Yes. It will be. <laughs> so, you know, keep your eyes peeled for our newsletter, our website, and our Facebook page, and you should be able to find the information to connect with us for that. The great trip, Kate. Yes. No, I want to go to Veracruz. Actually, yeah. <laughs>
Oh, do go. Yeah, we'll go with you. <laughs> Becky, yeah. Yeah, yeah let's go. We went. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Look, just a few of us left. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Look, look how quickly they flee away. <laughs> God, I don't know how to make it go away. Good to see you, Max. And Kathy's over there somewhere. All right. Bye-bye.